morning, everyone. Welcome to Francis and Friends. So glad to have you joining us on this Monday morning. We want to welcome Dr. Gray. Good morning, Pastor. Good to be here. Brother Jonathan Steele is here. It's great to be here, Brother Donnie. Brother Dave Smith is here. Yes, sir. Good to be here. I'd like to invite people to a couple of meetings this month that we have March 9th and 10th. This is in Kensett, Arkansas, Way of the Cross Church. Russell and Kim Merriman are the pastors there. And we will have service on Saturday at 6, Sunday at 10, and 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. We don't want want one at 10 p.m. And then uh, March 22nd through the 24th, Message of the Cross Family Worship Center. This is uh, Dallas and Kim Smith, the pastors there. And uh, service Friday night at 7, Saturday at 6, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. If you live in these areas, Kensett, Arkansas is northeast Arkansas. And Hayden, Alabama is just north of Birmingham. So yep. if you live in those areas, come and be with us. Kent's it's right there by Searcy. Mm-hmm. And it's a great mm-hmm. place. Yes, sir. Great, great place. And we're so happy to have, uh, this will be the last day he'll be with us, but he was with us on the program Thursday. And he preached for us Sunday morning and Sunday night. But Pastor John Mosbach, all the way from the great country of the Netherlands. And John, glad to have you back. Good morning, Brother Donnie. It's great to be here. You have... You have, uh, uh, through your sermons, you have cured me from curry. <laughs> yeah. I, will, I, will never, I will never be able to eat curry again. And uh, so, uh, and if those of you don't know what I'm talking about, you should have been watching. <laughs> you should have been watching. But we'll come back to John in just a moment. I want to thank each and every one of you for your help Friday. And uh, as we kicked off the month of March with our Bible-thon, our grand total was 45,810. Out of that, there was 41,059 outreach Bibles. And we just are so appreciative and so grateful for all that you did in that regard. And and, uh, Honduras, and then we were able to get uh, about 13,000, 14,000 Bibles of Pakistan. We'll finish Pakistan in, in April, and uh, I want to thank as well Pastor Kenny Flaming for driving over. He is the pastor that has distributed uh, these Bibles in Pakistan. This will be when he brings these Bibles. I think this will be his fourth trip, third or fourth, I can't remember now, but uh, he was here Friday sharing with us uh, some phenomenal stories and and pictures of the Bible distributions there in, in, the pa- in Pakistan, so uh, we want to thank each and every one of you. This weekend, I'm going to be in Palm Harbor, Florida. That's March the 8th through the 10th. That's the Tampa Bay area, Christ Church of Palm Harbor, Friday and Saturday night at 7 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And so I just want to invite everyone in the greater Tampa Bay area to come and be with us. And then into this month, March the 27th through the 31st, we're going to be celebrating our annual resurrection camp meeting. It's going to be a great, great time as Christians from literally all over the world come to Baton Rouge and will help us celebrate the Resurrection Week. And uh, we have great services and uh, Gabe will be kicking it off uh, Wednesday night and then beginning on Thursday morning, uh, we'll be having three services a day. Uh, Lauren will be preaching on that Thursday morning service at 10 o'clock. Dr. Dupree will be doing the two o'clock service. And then Thursday night, Tommy Bates will be here. And uh, he'll be a blessing to the people. He always is. Friday morning at 10, I'll be preaching. And uh, Lauren, uh, Joseph will come back and do the 2 o'clock service. Dad will be preaching on uh, Friday night. And then uh, Gabriel will be come back on uh, Saturday morning. Then Paris Reagan at 2 o'clock. And then Bishop Tim Hill will be with us on that Saturday night and 
bless he'll bless us in song and in the word and then uh, I'll be doing the resurrection service on Sunday morning and then brother Lauren will be closing it out on Sunday night and so if you've never been to camp meeting this could well be the spiritual highlight of your year so we want you to go to jsmcampmeeting.org and register if you're coming Please pre-register. That's important. It helps us to plan accordingly. And as well, when you, if you're making up your mind to go, that website, jsmcampmeeting.org, will answer a lot of questions. It'll give you all the information regarding hotels in the area that are giving discounts. So please, jsmcampmeeting.org. And then on April the 12th through the 14th, I'm going to be in Gastonia, North Carolina. Carolina at Spirit of Life Church there in Gastonia. Friday, um, you know, it says six o'clock. I don't know if that, that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, I've never had a Friday night service at six o'clock. Uh, normally there's seven. So if you show up at six and we haven't started, you can look at me for an hour and I'll be there. And then, uh, but Saturday night is at six and then Sunday at 10.30. And uh, so we invite you to come out and be a part of these services. It's going to be a great, great time. Spirit of Life Church in Gastonia, North Carolina. That's the Charlotte area. So we look forward to having to seeing all of our media members in that area. So come out and be with us. We are in verse number 14, chapter 6 of the book of Galatians, and we will finish Galatians tomorrow, and, uh, and then we'll pick up the book of First Peter. Uh, that will be the next book that we are dealing with, First Peter. And we won't start on that until Wednesday week. I'll be leaving Wednesday morning, and I won't be here Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then Monday, we start the uh, April, the March, I get the months mixed up, getting old. The March share will begin on that Monday. So we'll pick up the introduction to 1 Peter on that Wednesday. Paul says in verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory. And that word glory, you could also put the word boast there because that's what it means. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And that first part of that phrase, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is Paul presenting to the reader and to these Galatian believers uh, that which is in direct contrast contrast to the Judaizers. They were glorying in works, that primary work being the rite of circumcision. They were trying to bring these Gentile believers into, well, actually to make them proselyte Jews. That's really what was going on here. And so they were glorying in religious works. And Paul is making it very clear as he sets forth his own basis of boasting and saying there's nothing in the law to boast about. The law did not save you. The law cannot sanctify you. The doing of the law is just religious activity. The law was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And then Paul is stating, by when his statement, I will glory in the cross, he's saying the only means, number one, of salvation is the cross. And number two, the only means of sanctification is the cross. The same faith that justifies is the same faith that sanctifies. It's not in the doing. It's not in the work no matter how religious they may be. And this is not an indictment against work. As a child of God, we should produce good works. But the difference is, if the Holy Spirit is in us, and He is, and we have yielded to Him properly, we don't have to worry about good works. They'll just come. And, and we call it good works. It's the fruit. There will be fruit, godly fruit that will identify us as a child of God. God's grace, now listen to me, God's grace cannot function through any other means other than Christ and Him crucified. There is no grace in your church. There is no grace in the water. 
There is no grace in tongues. Grace can only come through who Jesus is and what he did at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. Grace is the means by which the Godhead determined that they were going to deal with humanity before this planet was ever created, before man was ever created. And, the, and, 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 and prior to Calvary, God's grace was distributed through the means of the sacrifice. They put their faith in what the sacrifice represented, not the act of performing the sacrifice, but faith in what the sacrifice represented, the sacrifice to come. So, when the moment you transfer your faith to your works, you have just shut the door on grace flowing into your life. You, have you ever noticed Christians that are so caught up in works? Well, first of all, it produces a self-righteous spirit and attitude. But if you've ever noticed there's no joy and there's no happiness there, you know why? There's no grace. Where there's grace, there's joy. Where there's grace, there's peace. But when you stop the flow of grace, all you do is you turn into one mean Christian. You're mean to everyone around you. You, you, you're, you don't have any joy. There's no happiness there because you are trying to live this life on the basis of what you do or you don't do. And you've tied the hand of the Holy Spirit. And he can't work. So with Paul, the cross is not a philosophy. It was a way of life. And that's the way that it should be as well. Then he said, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying that the only way that one can live a victorious, uh, overcoming life is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you as a believer, every day, you must make sure that the object of your faith is correct. And the object of your faith, I know many say, oh, it's, it's Jesus. Well, that's true, but how? It must be Christ and him crucified. You cannot separate the cross from Christ or Christ from the cross. They go hand in hand. He came to this earth to be the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that God the Father would accept. When he used the term by whom the world is crucified, he, 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 that, world, word, that word world is interesting because it has two aspects. First of all, it dealt with uh, the world which Paul knew before his salvation. And you can read that in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, where he declares, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. That's the world that he knew. So he's comparing who he is now to what he once was. He thought he was saved. He was very religious. He was a keeper of the law. Matter of fact, he was, he was Judaism's bright and shining star, the one that would have probably taken the place of Gamaliel as the wisest of all of the Jewish scholars. So he speaks of that, his zeal for the law, but he's also acknowledging that in that world, that zeal did not provide him salvation. That only came through Christ. Second meaning of the world work of the word world is this world's present this world, this present system of the world. We're, we're, we're saved and we're in this world, but the system of this world is Satan. He is the one that guides the affairs of a secular world. And we are children of God in this world, which means there's going to be conflict, which means there's going to be opposition. Mm -hmm. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. But Paul said that, that the point he's making is here is that, look, if, if you think you can make it by keeping laws and regulations, you can't. You're going to find yourself, as I found myself, as he's saying in Romans 7, and it was not producing fruit, but I was in bondage. 
And if, and, and if I can't do it, who do you think you are? You cannot live for the Lord through law, only through grace. And this world will prove to you in the blink of an eye how helpless and weak we are to try to come against this present world within our own strength. You know, think the, the really, the only thing that gives Satan problems is the child of God who truly understands who he is in Christ, who Christ is, what he did, and the purpose of what, of why he did it. Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. In this statement, for in Christ Jesus, those, those words right there, four words, for in Christ Jesus, that sums up the entirety of salvation. Those, that, those four words, what is salvation? For in Christ Jesus. Meaning that the only means of salvation is for a believing sinner to put their faith in who Christ is and what he did at Calvary's cross. That and that alone is what affords humanity salvation. That is what makes us righteous. That is what makes us holy. Not in the doing of religious rites and ceremonies and all these type of things, but simple faith. You know, it's interesting. The Word of God talks about Enoch. It said Enoch had this testimony that pleased God. Hebrews, Enoch had this testimony that pleased God. What, was a, what is the testimony that pleases God? The very next verse tells us, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. He had, his testimony was based on an unwavering faith in what was to come. He believed that a redeemer was to come mm. and his faith could not be moved off of that. And that's what got him translated. He's in heaven today in his natural body waiting to come back to fulfill the call of God upon his life as one of the two witnesses. So what? how do we get in Christ Jesus? Simple faith, that's it. You can't buy it, you can't earn it. It is received upon our admission that we are a sinner, that we cannot save ourselves, we cannot justify ourselves, we cannot sanctify ourselves, but it's all in Christ. And, and you know, that really when it comes down to it, you know, the world... Uh, they'll tolerate Jesus the teacher. They'll even tolerate Jesus the miracle worker. But here is the rub. They do not tolerate Jesus the Savior because their, their hostility is against the cross. The majority, the reason why the majority of people don't accept Christ is they refuse to acknowledge their depraved nature. Mm -hmm. They refuse to acknowledge that they're in need of a Savior. I'm not that bad. Yes, you are. You were born into sin and you will die in sin unless you accept Jesus Christ. Then he said, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. So now he's going back and blasting the Judaizers because that's what they were doing. They were trying to entice the Gentile men of the church there in Galatia to enter into the rite of circumcision. And this is a humorous statement, but it's true. Religion hurts. <laughs> You'll get that at about three o'clock in the morning. Religion will always extract its pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. Always. Because religion, you know, you know what one of the definitions in the old dictionary of religion was? To bind, B-I-N-D. That's all religion does, it binds. Mm. It's adherence. 
it, it puts them into slavery and into bondage. Uh, and, and we could say, well, that, you know, look, we're not having to deal with the circumcision question today. That's, 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 so this is just immaterial. That was for the, no, 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 no. We are dealing with the circumcision question. It's just in a different manner. It's no different than when one church says, you cannot be saved unless you're baptized in water. That's Galatianism. In their water. You cannot be saved unless you speak in tongues. That's Galatianism. You cannot be saved unless you're baptized according to our formula. That's Galatianism. You can't be saved unless you keep the Sabbath. That's Galatianism. That's modern day circumcision. That's all that it is. And Paul is making clear, none of that avails you. There's no saving grace in water. Tongues cannot save you. The keeping of a day cannot save you. It's the Lord of the day that saves you. It's Christ and Christ alone. So Paul was, was hitting these Judaizers right between the eyes because their whole world was wrapped up in doing, the doing of religious works. And then he said, but a new creature. He's saying, look, you can do all of these things, but you're going to be the same old person. But when you come to Christ and you put your faith in Christ and Christ alone, he makes you a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is therefore a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And, and, and that, but that statement, a new creature, it has a much greater meaning than you realize. It means that in the act of salvation, theologically and spiritually, there was a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Who you were died. The old man died. There is a new birth that has taken place. Uh, there is a transformation, if you will. You have been transformed and brought out of a kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. You have been transformed from an unholy, an unrighteous specimen into a man or a woman that is one with Christ. You are now holy, you are now righteous, and the enmity between you and God is gone. You are now a son or a daughter of God. You, you, you are part of the family. There's been a transformation. And that word transformation is, is interesting. Matter of fact, if you go look at Webster's uh, uh, New Collegiate Dictionary, the, uh, the word transformation, let me read you the definition of transformation. The genetic modification of a cell by introduction of DNA from a genetically different source. That perfectly sums up our word regeneration. The moment you got saved and transformed, you were regened. You were regenerated. It, you were infused, if you will, with a new, a new spiritual DNA. We're not like the world. Our DNA is different. I'm not talking about literal DNA. I'm speaking spiritually here. Because we are taking on the person and the image of Christ. Tomorrow we'll finish out with the last three verses of this great book. And it's only taken us about a year <laughs> to get through. And uh, when you count all the days that we have to miss because of travel and all the days we miss because of Bible thons and share thons and other rings. But, you know, I, I hope that you've, been, that you've been receiving something out of this. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful for all that Christ has done, is doing, and shall do in our hearts and lives. We pray that... This study of the book of Galatians has opened up this great book to the hearts and lives of the people. And Lord, we pray that that fruit would come from it. Now we bring as well the needs 
of the people, whatever those needs may be. And we ask that your grace would begin to flow on their behalf to meet those needs. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll be right back after the break. Truth, sometimes it's hard to find. That's why there's Francis and Friends. Join Francis and Friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Francis Swaggart. John, we got an email here that, that pertains to you. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so let me read this. And so you can comment and set the record straight okay, here. Okay, okay. Now, said, um, good morning. This man was on our SBN chat room yesterday, and I don't know, I don't have the slightest idea what that means. I guess they've got a chat room built around SBN. He said that he's friends with Mother, Brother Mossbach and gave his testimony how he was dying. And Pastor John prayed for him, and he's healed, and now he's preaching the gospel. Do you know what that's about? I pray for a lot of people, <laughs> and then I move on. So I don't always, I don't always like you. You say you know you don't always get the feedback, and sometimes years later you hear a testimony like this. Well, praise the Lord for that. Yeah, I believe it's true, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, that's it. And then this one, this is kind of we're not we're not going to dwell on this. But I think it's funny, so we'll read it. It said, uh, my wife and I really enjoyed uh, Brother Mossbox yesterday, both services. We would like to hear more about the subject of curry. <laughs> yeah, well, there's some good curry dishes out there. I, let me tell you, they make great food in India and Pakistan, those countries. And, uh, and I love those curry dishes. But if you get it so often as they eat it, our system is not just built for that. And their curry is very potent curry. I mean, it's strong stuff. So, uh, But they have wonderful dishes. I, uh, let me say that. Uh, <laughs> would not want to offend... A nation like India with 1.3 billion people about their curry, you know? It, it is. Curry can be very good, but it can, the way they eat it, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. You've never had a stomach on fire mm -hmm. <laughs> until you eat some of their oh, curry. Oh, I tell you. It I tell can you. be, uh, uh, now if you get it to where it's... Tears a, in your eyes. Yeah, if you get it to where it's a little well, mild. Well, can you tell me what is in it? I have no idea. Spices. Is, it, is rice and what? No, no, yeah, well, they use curry for uh, yes. almost all their dishes. And they have different curries. We only know, I think, the yellow curry of McCormick. But, but they'll, <laughs> put, they'll put chicken in it. They'll put... Yeah. They'll put uh, Any meat, protein, meat, uh, pork in it, you know. And uh, if you go to South Africa, especially in Durban, yeah. most of your big hotels will have a buffet and they'll have curry. On the buffet, but it's 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 milder. It's milder, and uh, so that's uh, it, it was quite funny. So you'll have to go to the mm -hmm. app and pull up the archives, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot that was said about that last <laughs> night. I'm going to ask you this question. It just came in because this really falls in line with your message yesterday morning. Uh, Jordan writes, why do we need the gift of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, well, there's a difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit, and then there's the indwelling um, of the Spirit and moving in power in your life, and there are the specific gifts that are given to those that are called for that, as the Bible says, that God gives to whom he wants what he wants as gift. So, but, but I think the church, without the gift of the Spirit, becomes and, and, and degrades to a human a religion organization, just like you have so many religions and so many organizations. It's that divine power 
that comes over us and in us and, and moves through us and, and aids. Like Paul, he says, I didn't come with the speaking of man's wisdom, but I came in demonstration of power through the Holy Spirit. I think that's a big difference. He, he, he had a lot of wisdom to share. And he lived in that wisdom, as we heard you in your first segment about Galatians. He knew, he knew so much about the word. He could quote chapters and chapters, but he lacked the key, which was Jesus. And after that, he submitted to that. And as he was filled by the spirit, he didn't bring it in his own strength, in his own wisdom, in his own words, but he relied upon the Lord to move through him. So I, I, I know in my life, Without the Holy Spirit, yeah. Uh, you know, brother, I was telling in your father's program a little testimony. I was, I was sick with COVID and I was laying there and I was dying. I mean, I, my, my lungs were full of it. I couldn't breathe. And I came to the point I was in quarantine alone. I couldn't even move from my back to my side anymore. I was like paralyzed there. I could hardly breathe. I had oxygen going on, but... Uh, and, and while I was there, laying there, the Lord spoke to me and said, I can, do more, I can do more through you now to my glory while your flesh is unable to do something than when you are in the strength of your flesh. Now that was a revelation in a way. We know it. We, I knew that, but, but at that moment when I was laying there and I couldn't move anymore, and the Lord said, I can do more now. I said, but how, Lord? Because I can't go nowhere. I cannot preach nothing. He said, well, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I need to be able in the flesh to go somewhere and work for you. But, but the lesson learned there, uh, 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 and you know, and then I saw Christ crucified for me, which I believe is the answer to all. But um, uh, 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 the Lord really showed me that it must be dead, the flesh. It must be surrendered. And it is the Lord doing his work. Now, as a servant of the Lord, you know, I've heard so many people say they love the Lord and they want to do so many things for the Lord. But what a difference between someone who is doing so much for the Lord out of love or whatever motivation is there, be it good or bad, or the Lord doing something and involving you and working through you. Outwardly for some people, it can look the same. But there is quite a difference if it's the Lord's work, if he's working his plan out in your life, through your life, and that happens through the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, I believe we could never do what we're doing. It would never have the impact that it has. It would never bring the change because after all, it's the Lord's work, it's his plan, and we are just, he's involving us and using us, and that's necessary. He needs flesh to work through but the flesh must be submitted to him, and, and that's the only way that all glory will go to him, I believe. Luke chapter four, verse 18, gives us the answer. Mm -hmm. Jesus said himself, the spirit of the Lord yeah. is upon me because he has anointed me. Now you've got to understand, I'm speaking to the person who wrote this email, you've got to understand that this was the man, Christ Jesus, he did not Everything he did on this earth, he did it as flesh and blood. He never performed one miracle as deity. He never spoke one sermon or taught as deity, but it was as a man anointed and full of the Holy Spirit. So if the man, Christ Jesus, who was the Son of God, if he had to have the help of the Holy Spirit, who is God, mm -hmm then how much more do we, who are poor, who are pitiful, who are flawed, have to have the Holy Spirit? Now, I think really what your question is rooted in, I think you're probably struggling with tongues. But you gotta understand something. Tongues is not the Holy Spirit. Now, do you understand that? That's the evidence that one has been filled. But you don't seek tongues, you seek the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit working and living in our lives. And I know your next question is, well, I thought I got the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Well, you did. But there's a difference between the spirit of regeneration and one spirit baptism. And I'll prove that from Scripture. Let me just ask you this question, Jordan. Just think about this. Who, and this goes for everybody, 
watching that has these questions. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, we know there was about 120 there. Well, who was there? Who was among those 120? Now, most of you are going to say, well, we have no idea. Yes, we do. We know the disciples were there minus Judas. And then more than likely, the rest were made up of more than likely the 70 that traveled with the Lord as well. When the Spirit fell and Peter preached the first inaugural message of the birth of the church, they were filled with the Spirit. Well, they were already saved. They had been saved for three and a half years and they had walked with the Lord for three and a half years. So they had, the Holy Spirit was already in them in regards to regeneration. But now they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Two separate acts. I'll prove it to you again in, in Acts 8. When uh, Philip went down to Samaria and he preached... The Bible said several things happened. Miracles took place. Sick bodies were healed. Demons were cast out. But people were saved. Mm -hmm. But when he went back to Jerusalem, the elders asked him how many people were filled with the Spirit. And there were none because he didn't preach on it. And they immediately sent Peter and John to pray for those who had gotten saved and they were filled with the Spirit. And you could just keep going down the line with that. So you need to put those things and think of those things but the ball comes down to this. The Holy Spirit is the organism, the life force of the church. Mm -hmm. And without him, That's good. nothing's going to happen. So I hope that answers your question. Mother? Yes, and um, thank you, Donnie. Um, I want to say to uh, Brother Moshbach, we enjoyed that message last night. <laughs> and yesterday morning. I both told of you them. a lot about myself, even some parts that uh, you would keep inside, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? During the service, though, I got to thinking, um, your grandfather, was he in the ministry? No, not my grandfather, but he was a believing man. And I was wondering how your dad came to know the Lord and, and get into the ministry like what you've been telling us about. Well, my grandfather and mother were believing, but from the more traditional side. And uh, as a young man, I, uh, I think at 15, my father went out of the family, started going on ships to work uh, as a cook's mate. And I believe that was very important that he was raised in one way in the faith, but on the other hand, he was taken out of that traditionalism which was ruling in Holland and introduced to the full gospel and, 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 the, and the Pentecostal message. Yeah, you know, Dr. Gray, his dad, um, you weren't raised, as, uh, he wasn't saved until after you were up in age, was it? No, he, I was born later, Yeah. but he, he was not saved till the age of 30. Uh -huh. and, and he, he had lived the life of a drunkard. And but then most of his family are preachers. Mm -hmm. That's what's so amazing. Seven, seven out of 14. Can I ask a question? Sure, please You do. didn't mention the root. What, what faith was your par par your parents or your grandparents? Was it was it a re the Reformed faith or, yeah, more or Lutheran? <clears throat> yeah, the, the Reformed, Dutch Reformed. Okay. Well, that's that was the faith, you know, that Arminius came from. Mm. As well as many other Calvinists. Yeah, that was uh, in the in the in the uh, the north of Holland. That was predominant, and then in the south, you had more the Catholic uh, yeah. faith. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, did any Dave, Jonathan, did y'all have anything that you'd like to ask before we get involved in the program? Okay. Uh, I want you to share with us some uh, your dad and his ministry. Uh, I was relating to a lot of it concerning my husband's family. Last night, as you were, and some things you were telling, it was almost like it was me reliving some things of how the Lord moved and worked, and and the tremendous uh, amount of people that you folks so saved uh, in in your dad's ministry, and uh, of course, then you come back, uh, come up, and you're doing a great ministry as well. But as your dad. Um, 
he got saved. When did your father get saved versus your, your, his father being saved? Well, my father really got saved as a young man. I believe he was nine at a, a street service of the Salvation Army. <laughs> That's where he gave his heart to the Lord. And, um, you know... Uh, a uh, street service. A street service. We used to have those. Oh, my. My husband and I would go out every Saturday and have street services. Yeah, and on that street service, they would have a bench. They called the sinner's bench. And at the end of the meeting, the captain uh, of the Salvation Army would give the altar call and you'd have to come forward and kneel on the sinner's bench and then you would pray the sinner's prayer. And my father, for two times, he, he wanted to do it. He was longing for that because he did feel the call of the Lord. I mean, mm. I, I think there was something on his life already. The hand of the Lord was there, pulling him, calling him. But you know, he, he was a little bit ashamed to go to the sinner's bench. So he, 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 he said, well, I can do that at home. But when he wanted to pray it at home, he heard a voice, the Lord say, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. And uh, so the next time he said, now this time I'm determined, I'm going to do it. But at the moment there, and I believe he's not the only one. I think there are many like this. They want to, but at that moment, thoughts and other things yeah. keep you away. So again, for the second time, he said, I'll do it at home. I'll do it at home. But again, he heard the voice of the Lord. If uh, you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed mm -hmm. of you. And so the third time he was so determined because he, the fear of the Lord gripped him like if the Lord would come back tonight and I would miss this opportunity again, I'd be lost. So before the captain even finished the altar call, he ran to the front and kneeled down. My mom was raised also in the, in the faith, but also in, in the more traditional, you know, reformed stuff. And uh, when she heard the message of salvation, she was in shock, you know, like me, a sinner. Now, that was something <laughs> like, and not because she was rebellious, but I mean, genuinely, she thought me, a sinner that needs to repent like, like, like a real sinner. Mm. You know, I mean, I, 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 I haven't lived a life like that. I haven't been raised like that. I, I, I've always been in church. I've, I've, for me to, to, to have to go through the same process as somebody, that, that was something for her very difficult to accept until the Lord. And it wasn't because of, well, there's pride there, but I mean, it was not out of a rebellion or so. It was mm. the way she was raised that, that it just... Didn't, didn't connect until the Lord really through the Holy Spirit convicted her and uh, oh man she got and cried before the Lord and asked and repented and asked mm. for forgiveness so that, that, you know that, that traditional church can keep you away from real salvation yes yes well yes. She, she had probably been baptized as a child as a baby yeah, I, probably went through catechism. Uh, uh, I don't know if she was in, in that kind but, but she, she was raised in a way at least that you know for her that was something that she that was, it was settled settled and didn't have to go through that yeah yeah but praise the lord <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> praise the lord pra praise the for lord. the holy spirit who came and yes. did what no man could do and and, and spoke into her heart and yeah. gave that and that's the work of the holy spirit that he comes and convinces and convicts and and brings us to repentance. So uh, they had true born again experience, Papa and Mama. And uh, I was raised in church, you know, uh, but I, for me too, I can say I had my true born again experience. I remember one time I was preaching and in my excitement of preaching, I said, I'm a second generation preacher. And I meant like my father before me, I'm also a preacher. And in one way I'm, that's the truth. But the moment I said it, in the service, the Holy Spirit came and said, I don't have second generation preachers, I only have first generation preachers. Yes. I don't have grandchildren, and I'm not called a grandfather. 
And I had to correct that right there. And I understood what the Lord meant. Yes, maybe in one way I am a second generation preacher, but every person needs their own born again experience. Mm. That's right. And I had that. So, I mean, I am a first generation. I am a child, not a grandchild of God. I, mm. I know him as my father and I don't pray to my grandfather. That's good. No. That's, you know, that's just amazing what God can do in families and how that he can, you know, like Dr. Gray, seven of his mm. brothers or relatives are ministers, whereas before there was no one in the whole family. Same way in my family, same way in my husband's family. Mm. And now, you know, we have a lot of people that are saved within our families. But when we came to the Lord, that wasn't the case. And that was just amazing to me, uh, what you were saying last night, how, how close and related to what had happened in our salvation experience. I have a question I want to ask the guys. We, we brought this up last week, panel, and I want to get your opinion on this, too. Uh, and um, so I just read the email. Said I was confused by Donnie and the doctor's remarks regarding the child molester who got saved. Going by scripture, John 3, 16. Remember us talking about the child molester that got saved and then was upset because he was not accepted in the church mm -hmm. because he had been, he could not be around children and come in close comp proximity to him. I don't know what your laws would be in Australia, but when it comes to children. Holland. <laughs> Holland. Holland, I'm sorry. Australia, why? I told someone this morning he's from Australia. That's right. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway. Well, they call it Netherlands now. <laughs> <laughs> Netherlands. Okay. Um, but anyway, this uh, man was very upset and wrote us and was questioning why he could not be welcome in a church. This email is in response to that program. And the question is, so why would this man who has been washed in the blood, as scripture says, and has become a new creation, not be allowed in your church? I can understand where Donnie and the doctor are coming from, but this is Donnie and the doctor's faith wavering that the man wasn't washed in the blood and saved. Um, okay, and then they go on to equate smoking and drinking and adulterers. Are we do, do we not allow adulterers in our church when they get saved and so forth and so on? Um, uh, can, so, I, can I respond to that? Yes. You know, uh, I'm the one that told the story about the man that uh, uh, had, had uh, I guess he was a young man, but he raped a teenager in the city. This city is a small town where everybody knew everybody. And uh, this, this young man that did the crime had, had gone to First Assembly for many years, but he had backslidden and living for, for the devil. But uh, in that story, the reason why my board and I took the position was because the person that he raped, her, her best friend was in our church. And then the best friend was there and had clear memories of it. And uh, we, we, we wondered whether or not it would, it would greatly offend her. And I might say that the, the lady that would be offended, I, I would call out her name, but I don't want to, her, her brother was also in our church, and he would be offended. But the, 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 real, the real issue there is state law. Mm -hmm. State law does not permit a person that's been convicted of certain crimes to be around children. And he had, uh, he was a, what, what was the term called? not molester, he was a sex offender. That was the term. Right. He was a, a guilty sex offender, so he could not be around the schoolyards. He could not be around children in any setting, and uh, that's just the way it was. So I, I, I support that, I, I understand. The question is, do people like that ever go back? They're, they're washed, yes, they're saved, yes. Do they ever go back into 
sins of the past. Sad to say, some do. You know, we're not doubting someone's salvation. salvation. Exactly. We're not saying they're not saved. And, I, and I, no one on this panel, I believe it was Friday, no one on this, or Wednesday, no one on this panel said anything about someone not being saved. We pray that every child molester, every sex offender, every rapist, we pray they all radically get saved. And anything we can do, turning on SBN, that they can... We can play a part in that, we want to. However, it is using wisdom, and I use this example. Someone gets radically saved as a drunk. They, I mean, they spent 45 years drinking every single day, flipping couch cushions, just trying to find money they can, but they get radically saved. I'm not gonna look at them and say, hey, we're going to go to the nearest bar and witness to people. I'm not going to send them because that's a temptation that they will have after 45 years of drinking. That's just using wisdom. And then you add state laws to it. You, you've got to use wisdom as a yeah. pastor and who you have in your congregation. Right. I, I wrote down four things to answer this man's question. Number one, you've already said, it's the law. Yeah. We've got to obey the law. Just like as a, as a pastor, state of Louisiana, if one of my parishioners comes to me and says, uh, this person has molested my child, I've got to pick up the phone and call the police. Yeah. I have no choice. If I don't, I'll be arrested. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Number two, we believe the grace of God, the blood of Jesus covers all sin, and I have no doubt that individuals that committed this horrible sin in a younger state can get saved and cleansed. But we must un they must understand that some sins have a greater consequence mm -hmm. in the public eye than others, yeah. okay? That's right. Number, th number three, as a pastor, that pastor has a greater responsibility to the sheep that are there to let them know, as a pastor, we are doing our best to look out for you, and especially the most vulnerable of our congregation, which is the children. And then, but the last thing is the main thing that I would present. A true, a person that committed this horrible sin, and they truly gotten saved, with the help of the Spirit, they're gonna understand that's just the way that yes, it is. Right. And they're not gonna argue that point. Right. They'll say, oh, I understand, and I'm gonna listen online or watch on television. Uh, can I call for counseling if I need it or whatever? And of course you can, absolutely. Uh, if I have a prayer request, can I call it in? Will you pray for me? Would, can, can somebody come anoint me with oil if I need it at my house? We would do that in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. But a true life that's been transformed would recognize, look, I committed a great sin against individuals that could not defend themselves, the most vulnerable of society, our children. And I'm going to have to wear that externally to the world until I die, not spiritually, but externally to the world. And they'll understand, they should understand that. Yeah, we're going to have to go to a quick break, and then I'm going to come back after the break to, to Brother Mishbach. I want to see what they would, how they'd handle this in Holland. Um, and this is something that's happened in our churches. Um, I know of a pastor that was faced with this. He had a man get saved, found out he was a child molester, and uh, the man came to church um, wanting to get involved in, you know, church groups. And the pastor did not feel like that he could allow that out of protection for over his people. It's, it's a responsibility you have there. So we were discussing that. Uh, and it's been several things that's happened that we have to look at. This email brings out the point. Well, you've had a terrorist before on your program. So who are you more afraid of, the terrorist or the child? abuser and she was trying to say because God's grace has saved them and uh, we thank God for that I wish every one of them had, could be but, saved but they're forgetting the law right there's yeah. no law on the books that says right. somebody that even committing murder right there's no law that says they cannot be integrated but I'm going society. past I'm going past that as a pastor Donnie yes we're not going but as a pastor 
Mm. Can you, there's some things that you, you have just want to protect. You've got to protect the children in your church. Are you going to put this man up teaching a class? Well, one quick thought. Your insurance carrier will demand that you not have any That's right. one like that on the property. You're talking about right. liability. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it is a liability, but I'm going past that. As a Christian pastor over this church, and I got to go to the break. We're going to be right back after the break, and I'm going to allow you guys to discuss it. Uh, your convictions as a pastor, can you allow that? Mm -hmm. And we'll be right back. Find out more about Francis and Friends on our website, francisandfriends.com. Previous Francis and Friends programs are available online at sunlifetv.com. Okay, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to take our discussion that we've been having to <laughs> Brother uh, Mishbach. I want to hear... Moshbach. Okay, I apologize. I am uh, just <laughs> butchering your name. You can call me John. But I want to see... <laughs> John, that's I want to see. I want to see what you would say. You have a church. You have the same responsibilities we all do yeah, in I, Holland. I'm pastoring uh, uh, well over 30 years. And, of course, in those years, we had to deal with similar issues. And and, um, you know, fallen man and sin is a horrific thing. I mean, it, it stoops so low and does things that are horrible and has such a great effect on other people's lives, impacts. And this, we're talking about a, a subject that, that, that scars and ruins lives of others. Um, right. I can understand some that are watching and maybe dealing with this in their own heart, battling with this. They, they love the Lord, but they have desires that go out, out of the sinful man that, you know, they are a new creation, but that old man still once in a while comes up that uh, they might say, well, I'm never going to tell them the truth, what's going on in my life, but they need help. They need help because you usually don't get out of this without some help. But on the other hand, I tell you, as a pastor, we have a responsibility. And if somebody like that comes in the church and they're open and honest, uh, yes, you try to help them in different ways, but I, even if they're saved, delivered, uh, 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 you know, and, 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 and spirit-filled, I would never... In any, in any chance, put them near or about any children or whatever, or if, 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 like if you wouldn't allow them in church, yeah, that's, that's another thing. I don't know how that all works. The law is not like that in Holland exactly. But, but I mean, you, you can never, tr but these people cannot trust themselves. We cannot trust them. But it's not just taking in protection the children and others. It's also taking in protection the person himself. Because they, 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 there can be a moment of weakness. And if you put them in a place of temptation or, or, or a place where that can happen, because even if they love the Lord and would never want to commit this sin, they know it's terrible, uh, their heart and desires, it will always try to find a place where an opening is. That's why they go in a place of confidence. They go like a priest or, or, or a place as a counselor or a place where they can be alone and, and, and that the desires can, can, can fulfill what it desires. The, the heart always chooses the path that fits with the secret desires of the heart. So I think they need protection for themselves and we need to protect them. I do believe without a shadow of doubt, that the blood of Christ cleanses of yes. all sin, of, even of these sins, it cleanses of all sins. But that doesn't mean that you would put them in a place or in a position or, or in an area where, where anything like this could happen yeah, what again. What about allowing them to attend church? Um, it can be difficult. I know uh, we had somebody like that, but you know... Um, well, I, you know, I had to put some uh, elders in charge to always keep an eye on. <laughs> yeah. Always keep an eye. And, and along the line, it didn't go together anymore. It was too difficult to combine it uh, in the church. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the bottom line, too, is if it's somebody that you don't know and you're not having daily interaction, you're left 
taking their word that there has been a transformative experience in their life. I'd rather err on the side of protecting children. Yeah, that's right. Any day of the week. And I will not apologize for that. I will not back up from that. And I won't lose one second of sleep over that. Can I share a quick story? Um, at, a, at, a, at a church that I used to pastor, and I was not there at this time, uh, they had a family that stood up and told the pastor that the youth minister had molested a child, a teenager. And that ended up becoming a major lawsuit because they felt like somebody in the church knew it and didn't and, and covered it up. That church was sued probably million dollars plus. That church went through a horrendous court thing for about one, two, three years. It just tore that church apart. It hurt badly. People chose sides, what should we do? It's a very terrible thing. This is the result of sin, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is the result of sin, but churches have got to be careful. They, they just, we cannot, we, we cannot believe. I, I know people can change radically, I believe in that. My dad was a drunkard, and God saved him and changed him. He never went back to it. Lots of people never go back to this sin. But it seems that the demonic forces that cause people to rape and do things like that, it seems like that demon comes back. That's right. And sometimes those people fall back into it. So, if the, you know, we're going to have to be very careful about it. And state law does require us to not allow them among the children. Okay. Think no, of what? this. Now, so, yeah, go so, ahead. Don't know. Uh, well, you know, some, some, some sin that people have in church, it, it deals with themselves and it damages themselves. If that's the fact, mm -hmm. then as a pastor, you can be, take more time with it. But as a pastor, a shepherd, if they have something that affects others in the church or that has an impact on others, then you deal with it different. I mean, then you cannot give them the, 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 the leniency or the room that you might give to someone. If someone goes out and drinks all night and, and, and he's ruining himself and it doesn't affect others in the church, well, you can take some more time to help such a person to get through that time. Right. Sure. But if they're committing something that is directly impacting other sheep or and yeah. even not the sheep we're talking about the lambs yes. the little lambs little now lamb. then as a shepherd I think you have an, a, 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 an obligation to 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 take care and if you know it and don't say anything and this goes on and another family goes through the ringer like that I mean you're responsible uh, responsible right. for that mm -hmm. so I think when these things are about you you need to do something about it you cannot just trust and let it go. You know, I've listened to what each of you have said and other sins like alcoholism, adultery, uh, adultery, all those type of things. It involves that individual. But when you talk about rape and we, uh, for children, uh, sexual molestation for a little child, what that person do, is doing is harming somebody else. It's not only harming them or him, it's also harming somebody else. There's someone else being harmed. And a family. Yeah, by what that person has done. And I, and then that's what I look at. A statement was made here. Do you all agree or disagree that all sin is sin? Is all sin I don't. same across the board? Well, there know that in the Bible, very template, very very plainly tells us there's degrees of punishment in yes. hell. So that tells us that in the eyes of God, some sin is worse than others. And, you know, and, in, yeah. and in Leviticus, different sins would give different punishments. Exactly. And, and, and you know, um, murder in the Bible was not looked at the same as stealing. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because stealing, if you were caught... You had to pay back. You had right. to give it back, and then re and then whatever you deprive that person of, it had to be given back in like kind. But murder, you forfeited your life. No. Yeah. So that's degrees of punishment, and we have the same thing in the court system today. 
if if whether it's first degree, you know, if it's first degree murder, if you live in a state with capital punishment, you're more than likely going to forfeit your life. If not, you're going to spend most of your life in prison. But at the same time, the second degree murder has a certain application, manslaughter. So, so I'm going to be, if, if I defraud, if I defraud somebody, I'm not going to be judged as a first degree murderer. Right. I'll be judged according to those laws. So that tells us that there are even in the, and look, our criminal court system, the laws of the land derive from the word of God. Yeah. Why do we have different levels of punishment? Because exactly. the word of God has different levels of punishment. And you're looking at children. That's it. Yeah. Who are indefensible for the most part. Innocent, innocent. Yeah. So that make, puts a whole nother light on things. Not only that, they can be seduced because you are a, a, an adult. If you were raised like mother and dad raised me, man, if an adult says anything to you, you stop and listen. Right. And you can, they can be very easily influenced yeah. to be taken advantage of. Especially people that have authority over them. Exactly. Like right. a teacher or... But even if that person doesn't have authority, they are an adult. Yes. You know, it's just like, let me go back in time. We had, this was years ago. Uh, we had a situation brought to our attention in the church that an individual, a man, was out in the lobby and he was a greeter and that he was getting too friendly with the ladies. But he was an older man. Mm -hmm. So we sent someone, sat him down, talked to him, and told him, stop. And, and you know, he was very loved. You know, everybody all brought, you know, but some husbands were, and some wives were not appreciative of things he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he stopped for a while, then it started again went to him again and said stop well a few weeks later dad was walking for, dad dad is i don't think he's ever been in the lobby of our church during <laughs> church he's been in the lobby scores of times but never one church is you know the beginning walk but for some reason he had to go from the platform before church started and he had to go somewhere and he was walking through the lobby and he saw him and he saw the problem and he walked right up to him and said, we told you twice. Now get out. Don't come back. Because he had been warned three times. This was the third time. Mm. But, and you know, when we deal with stuff, but we're taking people's words for it. But he saw it firsthand, even though it would pass by, slip by most people. But he saw what the man was doing, and he just walked up to him and said, we've told you not to do this. You disobeyed, now leave. All right, oh. based on what you're saying, the rest of you have said, let me read this statement. The Bible says that all sin is sin. Mm. Someone, some are more prevalent than others, but when you truly accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're washed in the blood, does not God cast all sin into the sea of forgetfulness? Yes. The, the problem there is not God. The problem there is people. Exactly right. People do not have a sea of forgetfulness that they cast everything to. And yes, the Bible says cast all our cares on God because he cares for us. But when you harm a child, you know what? Let's even bring this out of child molestation because to register as a sex offender. Let's say you raped a woman. That's still being registered as a sex offender. Whenever you do that, there are consequences to your actions. First of all, again, state and federal laws. There are consequences to your actions. But number two, you have harmed that person most likely for life. That's something they are going to have to battle. There are people that have been uh, sexually molested as children. There have been people that have been raped as adults and they can no longer even be intimate with their spouses. It hinders their life. You have harmed someone. It's not about whether God has forgiven. I agree, whenever God throws something into the sea of forgetfulness, all sin is equal at that point because God has forgiven it and it is forgotten. But people are not God. And whenever you've harmed somebody, 
Yes, they can forgive you, but that doesn't mean they have to be around you. That doesn't mean that there aren't consequences to your action. Brother Larson has said it before. Sometimes when you take a big bite of stupid, you gotta <laughs> digest it. And it gotta, it has to come out the other end. Yeah. There's a lot of things that have to take place. It's consequences to your actions. And there are severe consequences to certain actions. And you, that's just how society works. And you've got to learn how to operate in that. Is it not true that forgiveness is not trust? Absolutely yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's, uh, absolutely. So, but once again, once again, they are negating the fact of who the injured parties are. Children. Mm -hmm. And that, that sums it all up it right does. there. there. There is one other factor, and that is the flesh. We can be forgiven, but the Adamic nature is never removed. That's why the free will. That's where you brought in a few minutes right. ago the free will. And you can, you can have people clean, uh, uh, live free of a bondage for years, but all of a sudden... Jumps back. Something happens in their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something pushes, and then all of a sudden that problem begins to crop up again. And it's a big difference in that problem being a drink of whiskey or smoking a cigarette mm -hmm. or saying a cuss word or thinking See, a lustful See, those thought. things that you mentioned harm you. Right. It's not harming the other person. But it's what a we're big, talking about, you have a second party that's being harmed and a child. But it's a big difference if that torment is involved what you do to other people. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. had mentioned the example of a person who embezzled funds. You wouldn't let that person deal with funds in the No, I'd let them come extent. to church. But see, that's not the question. The question is not from them, well, not only do you let them in the church, but you let them teach Sunday school and you let them be uh, help with children. So, you know, the question is just simply come to church. But the point I'm making, and, and if they don't want to accept it, that's fine because they're not a pastor. Mm -hmm. But when you step behind that pulpit in a position of responsibility, you've got to take in consideration you're right. having to look out for the entirety of the congregation. Yeah. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, I'm yeah. not, if I'm a parent of a young child, I'm not letting them go to church. Somewhere where they're letting a convicted sex molester come in and sit on the pew. I'm gonna, I'm gonna thank the Lord that they're saved, but I'm going to say, you know, if, you, if you're truly born again, you would understand the consequence of your actions and you wouldn't try to force the issue. You right. would say, look, I'm perfectly, capable of living for the Lord in my cocoon and and I would love to go to church I would and love watch to watch SBN yeah but you would understand that it's like dad always taught me you know God forgives but there's certain sins that have a lifetime of consequence true, exactly. true. Right. David lifetime of consequences uh, a lifetime of consequences that that was born out in Hit the rebellion of his children that turned yep. against him, their untimely deaths, the turmoil of his life, all of this. Yes. And it forfeited, it also, he forfeited the right to build the temple mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing this person is saying before we uh, uh, go to another question. Okay, the uh, man stated that smoking and drinking that we said on the program, that smoking and drinking was a sin of the blood, but child molestation was a sin of the heart. So, do this, so does this not relate also to adulterers who are saved and allowed in your church? They also could be committing a sin of the mind uh, in church as is in murder, stealing, and in fact, every kind of sin. That person could still have that temptation in them also and carry it out in the church. Um, and then did, they did go you? in, if we had an ex-terrorist on the program and he was giving his testimony about getting saved, we would rejoice over it, and that's probably true. Did, was, the, was the sin that he mentioned was adultery? Yes. Well, adultery yeah. between two willing adults, that's different. Yeah. 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 And it's totally different if that person is underage. Yeah. Oh, that's, see, that's what they keep. That's, they're, they're, exactly. they're refusing to recognize we're Minor. dealing with one central issue. It's a, it's a defenseless child. 
And here's the problem. And what they're failing to recognize, one of the number one causes of teen suicide, they were sexually Absolutely. molested and abused. Exactly. One of the number one cause of, teen, of one of the causes of teen drug addiction and alcoholism, sexual molestation. Yeah. One of the major driving forces that turns kids in, into homosexuals or lesbians is that they were that was done to them. L look, until you've had to deal, and we've had to deal with it here, until you've had to deal with a 14-year-old girl. Yeah. Looking you right in the eye, and her exact words is, I hate the night, because that's yeah. when he comes into my room. Yeah. Or I hate my dad. Yeah. Yeah. I hate males. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they've got to understand there are certain things that scars individuals. Mm hmm that are mu that, that's why he said to set at liberty then that are bruised. That's, de that's dealing right. with people right. that were molested yeah. and abused. And yeah. their, their heart is so crushed. I want to hear John's. That's better. It, what do you have to say? It, you know, it's easy to write those things if you're not the person that's responsible. Yes. And it's not easy to be a pastor, but thank God that we have pastors who dare to take decisions like this to protect the flock, and we need to do it. That's and right. if they understand it or not, that's our you responsibility. Still have got to do it's it. our responsibility to the Lord if we deny somebody entrance to the church. It doesn't mean they're not a child of God or you can't help them, but we have a responsibility. We need to make a decision there. And uh, I'm thankful for those that, because. Those that are weak in this and say, you know, oh, let them in and, you know, they love the Lord and we love people and take chances like that, I, I don't think And if you take right. a chance and you're wrong, a little child suffers. That's it. And then it's that family, it's that right. person that right. deals with it and you could have prevented it. Yeah. And that child's life could be wrecked totally and completely yeah. because of that, that you yeah. did not stand up for what you as a redult, uh, an mm -hmm. adult and that you were responsible for that child while it, was under, while it was under your care. See, I take that so strongly. We're very careful here at the school. You just look wrong and you don't, we don't keep you in the school room <laughs> because you can't. We, we got little bitty kids there. Uh, that we're trying to protect. Uh, we, I've got to take another quick break, and then we're going to start taking telephone calls. We have several on the line, and we'll be right back in just a moment. Email your questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Opposing opinions and viewpoints are always welcome on air at jsm.org. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back, and we're going to take our first caller, John from Kentucky. Welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. John, you have a question for the panel. Hello, John. Hello. Yes. You, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a question for the panel? Yes, I do. Okay. I, I have a relative. Oh, I'm going. To, it's my grandson. He was he was a uh, child molestation, and he, you know um, he's wanting to join the church and get back get back and have God forgive him for everything because he's asked the Lord to forgive him. But if he goes to a church and that church is refuses him. To, to enter into the church, ain't they, ain't, ain't that turn him up, turn him back into the world that he can He's trying to stay away from. Uh, could y'all get get one of y'all to comment on that, please? Well, we have commented on that, John. We we the pro, You've got to understand something as a person in leadership, a pastor. We have to take in consideration not just one person, but every single person that's been placed in our charge. And our responsibility, first of all, as adults, mm -hmm. and our responsibility as shepherds, uh, well, under shepherds, under the shepherd, is we've got to protect the flock. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to, we have to under, there's no circumstance that I could, as a, 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 with good conscience, allow someone to come into my church 
that ha I, I, my heart would break not being able to do it. And I mean that sincerely. Right. But I've got to look out for those yeah. who cannot defend themselves. Yeah. And, 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 but if, you're, if your grandson is truly repentant, then you should set him down and make him understand that, look, what you've done has hurt a lot of people and it carries a stigma with it. And if you're truly repentant, then you will understand and you would not want your presence to cause other people harm or to cause other people to feel right. uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, John, let me say this. We do apologize. I'm so sorry that that has happened to your grandson. How old is he? He's uh, 24. 24 now. When did this happen in his life? Uh, it's been about three years ago. About three years ago, after he was an he's adult then. He's, he's incarcerated right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, if I could say this too, uh, and I want to echo a little bit of what Brother Donnie just said. First of all, you have to understand from a viewpoint of a pastor, it's not easy to just look at someone and say you can't attend. That's not something that we want to do. That's not something we love to do. It's heartbreaking. It's heart wrenching. But again, for example, Family Worship Center, uh, we on average have anywhere from 100 to 120 kids just in powerhouse. If you count birth all the way up through teenagers, we easily have over 200, right. 200 underaged people inside of that church on a Sunday morning that we have to look out for. But John, if I could say this, whenever your grandson is out of incarceration, we might not be able to let him come to church. But first of all, there's SBN. Second of all, there's you. You can walk beside him. You can encourage him. You can help him. You can strengthen him. You can do devotions with him. He can come to your house. There's different things that you can do on a personal level to help him. That again, it's heartbreaking that we can't, but you can. And I want to encourage you. Encourage him even now while he's incarcerated. Send him letters. Help him walk and encourage him in the faith and do things that we can't do. That's where the Christian body is a beautiful thing. We might not be able to, but you can. You could be visiting him you right can. now. Absolutely. Ministering to him. Uh, usually in a prison, you can't take materials in, but you can have them sent directly to his address. So there are a lot of things that you could be doing uh, now and later on. But you can minister to that individual yes, even though they don't come to church. Let me ask you a question, John. Um, are you understanding why we're saying what we're saying? Well, I understand about the law and everything, right? but I, I couldn't understand uh, the church part because um, I understand the liability and everything. Uh, I think that one doctor, he talked earlier that that one church by having that one member in his church was under was under a lawsuit for what million dollars I believe he said yes the doctor yeah and uh, I just to me I was I, the church is telling this individual like my grandson when he gets out that you know that we love you Thank you for rededicating your life back to Christ, but yet you can't be a member of this church. To me, to me, that's turning him back to the world. Well, he said, "Well, but, the but, church can't help me." But yeah, but John, you got. But see, John, once again, you're only looking at it through the lens of your family, right? And I understand that. Oh, I understand that more than you realize. But you've got to remove yourself from the personal side of it. And then you've got to look at it through the lens of that pastor when he has the responsibility of everyone. And you don't, the, the, until you've lived through a church upheaval of this, because I know of churches that, that they brought people in like that and it ripped the churches apart. It destroyed works. And, and, and you've just, but you've got to recognize, John, 
the reality of people. That's just, you've got to recognize they're going to look at that situation in a totally different light than if he went to prison for embezzlement. Yeah. Or if he went to prison for drug possession or drug dealing or uh, a, a killing someone in 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 an alcohol-induced car wreck. You know, he's guilty of manslaughter. I, I, I hate to say it, but crimes against children are viewed in a totally different light. And that's just the way it's going to be. And that's two, not two. and that's not wrong that they are. And can I add, yes. state law is state law. It's non-negotiable. Two things. You're not throwing him away. You can right. still minister right. to that exactly. individual and provide uh, all kinds of ministry. But, John, put yourself in, in the place of a parent of a young child and try to look at it from that standpoint. Would you want to go to a church that allows a, a former molester into that church? I wouldn't. Yeah, it's a tough situation. But once again, as Dr. Gray said, John, and we, we, we're going to do this and we have to, we have no choice. Regardless of what our personal conviction may be, we have the law of the land of this state of Louisiana. And the law in the state of Louisiana, I don't know what it is, Kentucky, but the law in the state of Louisiana is very, very yes. clear. And, yeah. and matter of fact, it's just been in the last 10 or 15 years that they've really changed laws to toughen the laws in the state. It used to be when I first was ordained, John, I didn't have to, if, if, if a person came to me in confidence and said, uh, I'm being molested, I didn't have to turn that person in. But not now. I can go to jail. Yeah. I, I can be arrested because of the fact that if I'm aware of any potential molestation acts against a child and I don't report it, in the eyes of the state of Louisiana, I'm as guilty as the perpetrator. Morally, John, what do you say? Well, I don't think anything I can add or, or say would satisfy uh, John, John, who's on the phone, because it's his grandson. So, I mean, yep. there's something that's it. very... You have a soft place in your heart. Uh, that's, that's, that's it. And, it, I mean, it's hurting him, and it's painful, because yeah. uh, this is not the future he wants, and it's affecting his whole family, uh, what has right. happened. Right, right. So, I, 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 I understand that, and I can only say to John... I would only say, all you can do is bring it to the Lord in prayer. Bring your tears and bring this whole right. situation to the Lord and the yes. whole, everything that it's impacted and that it's doing and just ask him to help you and to lead you and to touch your grandson and that he will comfort what no man can do through the Holy and Spirit right and do a miracle. keep a right attitude. Keep a right attitude, a right heart to the Lord. Yes. Don't get angry and bitter at the church or at others or at yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> but right. bring it to the Lord, bring <laughs> right. it to the Lord and ask and just say, Lord, I don't know what to do anymore. I, I, there's, I, can't get, I don't know what to do, but Lord, I bring it to you. And will you please work in my grandson and in our family and bring some healing and change yes. and let it work out for the good that only you can do because we are bound by what we already told you. And I think I cannot add anything else to that. And, and well, you yourself, good. John, reach out to your I, grandson. Yes. And I, I understand and I, I truly understand. I thank you all for hearing me out this morning. And thank you, John, for your attitude. And that's what's going to get you through this. Right. And how you view, view this, and how you view the church's situation, right. and um, I just ask that you please, please have could, some understanding could, here. Could we get Donnie to pray for that family? Absolutely, Father, yes. in the name of Jesus, we bring John and his grandson before you right now. And Lord, I have no idea when this young man is going to receive his release from prison. But I'm asking, Lord, that there would be those, whether it's John himself or others in the family, that will take him and disciple him. Yes, Lord. And help him to understand and, and, and Lord, to, to help mitigate uh, the shame and the, and the stigma of this. 
But Lord, sometimes we understand there are consequences to our actions. But let John and other family members that know you as Lord and Savior be there to counsel and to disciple and to help him on his walk with the Lord. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's go to Betty in West Virginia. And Betty, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a question or comment for the panel? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, where in is, can I find it in the Bible? But if from the beginning of time to all the people in the whole wide world, they all had a chance to be saved. Well, I mean, time. Romans chapter one says that we are without excuse. It, it talks about two things that every person has. Number one, every person is born with conscience, right from wrong. But we also learn through scripture that that can be seared. It, 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 the more wrong that I do and the more I ignore conscience, the more silent it gets. But number two, we also have creation. Every single person that's born looks at creation and inside of them that it says someone or something has created it this and it longs for it and it sets this journey to go find the creator. And so we've got a Romans chapter one is very clear that every single person that is ever born because of conscience and because of creation, we are without excuse. Could we put on the screen Titus? Two eleven. All right, let's do that. Brother Donnie, can you read it? It's not on the screen yet. Okay, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Read the notes, Donnie. Is available to all on the basis of faith in Christ and what he did at the cross. Okay. So what's... Um, what, that's, that's all you need is that one verse. Yeah, verse 12. Well, that's not... Okay. So does that under, does that help you, Betty? Yes, it does. And uh, and can I ask another question? Sure. Uh, when the singers went before the soldiers to sing about God, what kept them, the enemy, from killing them before they got to the soldiers? Well, you got to understand. Well, look, I don't wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we can't go back in time and give you a blow by blow account of the strategies and the tactics and what thing. But you got to understand something. They didn't have guns in those days. And there was only a certain distance that they didn't come right up. The singers didn't march right up into the line of combat. They just led out the army and then eventually they split off. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. well I, I just, well, I'm dumb. That's why I called you. No, you're not dumb. It's just that that's that's that's, that's it. That's it. If you yeah. had a question like that, then other people had yeah. a question like question. that. Right. That's a good question. And thank you for calling, Betty. And let's go to Virginia in Alabama. Welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a question or a comment, please. Hello, Virginia. Hey. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, there was a young man in our little town, uh, a non-homosexual, unashamed, doing his thing, and uh, uh, he joyously got saved. And a family at the church, I think they even know the ones that led him to the Lord, but a family at that same church he was going to and everything they were both going to, they were together almost every day, if not every day, riding bikes, even the daddy. The daddy worked at the paper mill, and so he was able to be off, you know, the different hours. And the whole family would ride together, ride bikes together. And uh, as soon, as soon as there was a few seconds, seconds, and I know this, it, as soon as it was a few seconds, the youngest child in elementary school, a little girl, <laughs> Uh, he began being with her, and somebody come up and stopped the right part. He had done his hand all up, and you know, just she was just, just it wasn't her. I mean, she was just continuously crying and shaking, and and what and what is it? And she told, and uh, then they went down and, and talked to the police chief. And the main thing he said was, after talking to the man's the young man's daddy, was to say never again around her. Well, you see, the problem, what we've tried to bring out, Virginia, is that, is that 
God forgives and people do get saved, but they also struggle yes. with that horrible bondage. And sometimes, <clears throat> even though they, they, they've surrendered their heart to the Lord, the flesh is greater. The desires and the lust of the flesh is greater. And they do not, they don't understand how to live for the Lord and consequently, in a moment of, of great temptation or weakness, they, they resort to that. And, and so that's the point we're trying to make. I'm, I'm not doubting anyone's salvation, but at the same time, there's just certain things that I'm not gonna allow in my church because I cannot take the chance because it involves children. That's right, right. So thank you for calling. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question, quickly, um, uh, is concerning uh, what we do as missionary work here at the ministry, and that's provide Bibles and uh, preach the gospel. And what this person is saying, it's not just preach the gospel and give out Bibles, but do the gospel feed the hungry, provide water wells for those with no water, medical care for the ones who can't afford the care, help the poor. What have we done lately? What have you done to help the people with this? This is something to consider. How many other peoples, how many other ministries do this consider doing the same? I'd like to, I like to put my donation where it does the most good. And I do respect your ministry and I do receive from your ministry. And you know, at one time or other, uh, this ministry, we've done all of the above that I've read. Feed the hungry, and we're still doing that. Provide water wells, we've dug, I don't know how many water wells. Medical care for those that I can't afford. We've had medical vehicles in countries, several countries of the world. And uh, so we have done all of that. We're doing giving away Bibles once a month and uh, paying for television time around the world because we can meet, reach more people with the gospel that way than anything else that we have ever done. And not only that, this is what the Lord has told us to do. And so this is our miss missionary outreach from this ministry. Doesn't mean that here at our church, uh, we have a blessing house, if you want to call it that, where it's open two or three days a week for our local people here that need help. With well, we, we, we deal with homeless people. We had a brother, you know, we've got, we're dealing with a homeless man, right? Trying to help him out. We're clothing him. But, but that's well, all. But, but that's I'm all talking about as a point. church. I know that, that's, that's the church, but that's beside all the point. Here's what they're missing. Water wells. There's no, it's, it, it, it's, look, that's wonderful. We've done it. But that's not missions. That's humanitarian aid. And humanitarian works cannot be confused with the true biblical mission is preaching the gospel yes, it and is. teaching the gospel. And you know, when we were, were working directly in these countries and we'd bump into all of the state promoted promotions where they, would, they were there on the grounds providing food for the people, providing care. They're not on the ground providing the gospel and providing Bibles. Mm -hmm. They're not there doing that. And you also have to think, on this program, I can think of uh, the gentleman who is bringing Bibles into Venezuela Venezuela. I can think of uh, the couple that's in Kenya that's already distributed tens of thousands of Bibles throughout Kenya. Think of them as we're giving them Bibles and they're distributing. The gentleman that's uh, Venezuela on the shift with uh, Brother Gabe talked about how they also bring medicine. They, they bring uh, other books. They bring um, other aids to China, to Venezuela. Uh, Brother Kenny bringing things to Pakistan. So these people that we're giving Bibles to are also producing other aids. But again, as Brother Donnie said, yes, that's important, but there's non-Christian organizations that do all of those things around the world. But those non-Christian organizations, you know what they're not doing? Bringing the gospel. No. The gospel has to be number one. Right. Everything else, it's good. It's great. Yes, it should be done, but the gospel has to be priority. Here's the problem that people have got to understand. I hate to say this, but this is the truth. 
Christians, I'm speaking Christians now, they will give more to dig a water well than they will to get a person saved. Mm. That's wrong, folks. Yeah. That's wrong. They'll, they'll, they'll give more to put some clothes on a person's back but not preach the gospel. And it's very easy to get caught up in the humanitarian side. And if you're not careful, that will take all of your resources. Mm. Because you don't realize, we did, we built, uh, in one country alone, El Salvador, 37 schools that are still in operation today. One country. Mm. Worldwide, it's almost 200 that we've built. Churches, we've built them. Bible schools, we've built them. Um, I just was, when I was, just got back from South Africa, the pastor of the church told me, he said, I went to the Bible school that y'all built. That this ministry right. paid the money and built it. And that's great. That's wonderful. That's training pastors. But to be, and to be honest with you, that will have a greater impact than all of the clothes you can bring in and all of the meals you can provide mm -hmm. because that Bible school is turning out men and women that will go preach the gospel. And when people get separately, they're changed. And uh, you know, we're gonna have to be careful and close this part of it down. Let, let me just throw in, what is the Great Commission? Preach, Souls. Preach the, the gospel. gospel. Exactly. It didn't say clothe the hungry. That's I mean, clothe the, the, the naked. It didn't say feed the hungry. Now that's, that's a part, but here's another, the last thing I was saying that. I believe in the kingdom of God that God raises up certain uh, groups mm -hmm. to zero in on yes. certain things. Yes. So you've got those that are building schools or providing food or providing medicine. Praise the Lord. But it can never take the way that take away the fact oh, that God is going to raise up, and He must raise up those who are called to go and preach the gospel. Yes. We must we must do what the Apostle Paul did. Yes, yes. Let me say this: This ministry has spent millions of dollars promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Where it where they needed feeding, we fed them. Where they needed clothes, we gave them clothes. And when they need the gospel, we give them the gospel. If you do any of this work without the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're not helping anybody, but something, it might satisfy their hunger. And that's a blessing when people are hungry, and I understand that. But folks, anything you do without preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it cannot have the good uh, accomplished that it does when you tell them about Jesus Christ because that changes lives. Right. And, all. and I want to have you to have the last uh, word on this. We've been so thrilled to have you with us in the services, and I feel like this program, it gets carried on in different directions. But Brother... Um, Moshbach, is that right? We <laughs> we have enjoyed having you preaching in services on Sunday, being with us Wednesday night, and just being here, your presence has been a blessing, and we thank God for you. Thank you so much for having us, and uh, yeah, we're so thankful for your ministry, because I know all over the world people are being blessed by it, and I'm glad you stay focused on what called, God called you to do, yeah. but thank you for having me here, and I thoroughly enjoyed myself all these days. <laughs> you have great hospitality, and I'm to give a good report of what God has done. Wonderful, wonderful, and I'll be looking forward when you can come back and visit us next time, and Don I believe, are you going over this year sometime? Are you going? No, to not to Holland. Okay. All right. We want to thank all of you for being with us today. We've enjoyed having you. Pray this program's been a blessing uh, to you. And we will be back with you tomorrow, beginning at the same time. And in the meantime, continue listening to Sunlight Broadcasting because you will be blessed. Email questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Be sure to join Francis Swaggart on Facebook at facebook.com slash Francis Swaggart. Archive programs are available at sunlifetv.com. Francis and Friends is a production of the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.